You will not hurt my feelings by checking messages and emails. I know you can do two things at once or else you wouldn't be in marketing. What I'm going to be covering today, as the slide says, is conquering the competition with advanced targeting tactics. I am Jim Pond. I am a partner at JXM. Uh, along with a couple other partners, we are a small agency out of New England and have been working in the financial sector for probably about 13 or 14 years now. So enough about that. Let's move on. So the first thing I want to touch on is how what we all do is a zero-sum game. They, there really is no way for everyone to win. Almost any account, any customer, any member that you onboard, you're going to take from someone else, either directly or indirectly because they have a parent, an acquaintance that has a pre-existing pre relationship. So in reality, all marketing starts with breaking a relationship or ensuring that you're positioning your organization to showcase your greatest value against your competition's greatest weakness. And that's where the idea of fight or flight comes into play. Because one of the things that I see a great deal of is competing with everyone and really not having the stomach for staring into the mirror and going, we're not gonna go against, you know, Bank X, Credit Union X, you know, Neo Bank X, because we can't compete fundamentally. And that's a very, very important component that I think everyone should take away from this, that this is not only about who you should go against, it's about who you should not go against. Um, if you can't beat them on rates and you can't beat them on service and you can't beat them because of uh, their tech stack, then really what are you doing? You're ultimately wasting money. You're going to have a very hard time convincing someone that is currently at that competing organization to move over to yours. Now, is it always the case where, you know, say in all three, you have um, uh, a competitor that you just can't overcome? No, but I use that extreme example to make the point that we need to make sure that whenever we are looking at the competition, it isn't just from the standpoint of who we can win against. It should be from the standpoint of who we ultimately will not win against because marketing dollars are finite and we have to ensure we're flowing them to the absolute best application. So how can you go about doing that? One of the most important things you can do is the construction of a competitive insights matrix. And you wanna look at a couple things. I'm sure everyone here does some variation of this, monitoring, uh, monitoring rates, both on the deposit and lending side. Um, I'm sure you guys know who Rate Watch is, uh, as well as other services. I'm sure many of you utilize them. Analyzing their actual pricing strategies is an important component. And then product and service benchmarking. Now, that one I wanna pause on for a minute because that one takes a lot of work and people power. So one of the ways that uh, I generally suggest you go about doing this is actually having your team call into their service center, go into the branches, open up accounts, experience what it is like to go to that competitor. And the reason why I say that is not all information about uh, service levels and product levels is readily available online. However, one of the greatest tools you can use is social media. For example, um, I was monitoring in a, a situation in New England. I'm not going to tell you the state because I don't want to blow up anyone's spot. But in New England, uh, recently, there was a core conversion. And it didn't go great. And they are getting absolutely toasted on Facebook. Um, and we all know, you know one person complains. Who knows how many aren't happy or you know, vice versa. However, it does represent some of the conversation that's happening within their particular uh, customer group. So a credit union that I am friends with one of the CEOs and I frequently kind of share some of my, my thoughts with him, the next day they put together a targeting package uh, going directly after that, uh, uh, that other institution's membership and presenting their mobile and digital banking solution as 
uh, from a stability and uptime standpoint. So they honed in directly on one of the challenges that was going on, and now they're going after that customer base. Now, it's been going on for about a week. Can't really tell you how well it's going, but what I can tell you is that they were fast, they were watching, and they moved, and, and they moved on that opportunity because ultimately they know that they have to look at this from a highly competitive standpoint and they are ultimately taking market share away from someone for every account that that they open um, we use a relatively simple breakdown uh, this organization is not real uh, for fans of the lord of the rings you will know why um, now for uh, Kazakh Dune Capital, they have four branch locations, $300 million in assets, and an opportunity value of 17. That's one of the other core components that I want to bring up, is developing within your matrix a way of scoring the, uh, an opportunity value, um, utilizing both positive and negative integers. What you want to do is build out who has an overall strength overall weakness in specific areas, as well as the, um, the entire organization itself. Um, when you find that an entire organization uh, scores uh, uh, high from an opportunity standpoint, what you might want to do is instead of going after them from a product or service standpoint, you might want to flood their customer base or membership with uh, brand messaging as opposed to going specific product or service, because if they're showcasing general weakness across the board, well, you want to strike at, at that weakness and you want to stay away from uh, the competitive strengths. If you don't have the best mobile app and you don't have that great of a digital banking experience, be honest with yourself and stay away from the people that do. It's going to be really hard to convert them. And that level of honesty about your service offering and what you have is going to go very, very far because now instead of, say, going after 30 branch locations that you're competing with, you're going after 15. So you can uh, run those campaigns longer. You can expand into other media types. There are a lot, it opens up that opportunity because ultimately when you go after a very strong competitor, you're simply wasting money. Um, your likelihood of converting those individuals is you know, rather low. So what are some of the ways that you can go about building that type of matrix? Um, you want to look at tools, uh, SEM Rush uh, for SEO and pay-per-click insights. That's going to give you a lot of information about some of the, the keywords they may be paying for, which is going to suggest where they're actually running their advertising. Um, that's also a key component if you're going to start paying for their uh, organization's keyword uh, from a uh, pay-per-click basis. Now, obviously, there is a bit of a penalty there because uh, you're not exactly what that clicking customer is looking for. You're not necessarily, you know, your landing page, your keywords are not going to line up. So your quality score in AdWords is certainly going to be much lower. But if you're able to kind of force yourself in that into that conversation, again, with a weakened competitor, if they, you know, don't have the deposit rates you do or don't have the service levels that you do, you can build those campaigns to square up directly against the folks that are searching for, you know, Kazakh Dune online banking. That way, what you're doing is you're presenting directly to that specific membership. Um, another thing that you can look at is some of the uh, platforms like eMarketer. E um, the social listening tools are incredibly useful. Um, another one that I want to point out uh, is, is Callahan. A lot of their data is incredibly useful. Uh, and many times what it gets used for is for, you know, merger targets, acquisitions. But all of that, in, uh, you know, what makes a really good merger uh, or acquisition target might actually make a really good target or a great anti-target from a... Um, uh, from a competitive conquesting standpoint. So that can help you build that overall listing. Um, 
the next thing that I want to talk about is the idea of uh, smoke versus signals. And that kind of goes back into the concept of how your create what you're doing from a creative standpoint to go after uh, these various competitors. Uh, so when you're thinking about this from a creative standpoint, one of the things you need to realize that you're going to have to do is invest heavily in either creative development, building campaigns and creative for each specific uh, competitor, if you only have a few, or taking those competitors, building them into various levels and then serving that creative, okay, this group, they're all deposit week, this group is lending week, this group has a 20 minute wait time when calling into their call center. And those are all the ones that we're gonna focus on. And then building creative specifically for delivery to those, um, uh, to those competitors. And I do get into a little bit how you go about doing that, how you go about building that targeting, and then the tools uh, that you guys can use internally to actually build that kind of targeting yourself. So I, I do touch on that in a little bit. Um, creative, uh, creative diversity matters. Uh, the different ad placements is incredibly important. And this goes back to when I touched upon going after 15 different branch locations versus seven. You want to absolutely flood their customers and their membership. Um, you want to be hitting them omni-channel across the board, CTV, OTT. You want to be doing it with mobile billboards if you can. Uh, buy some billboards near their branches. Uh, you want to be utilizing pay-per-click social media. Um, I won't go over all different social media, so I'm sure you guys know what they are. Uh, so all those different platforms, you want to be using them all at all times for campaigns like this. Even more importantly, if you can build in a, uh, a stepped creative delivery so that you're actually telling a story and there's a narrative instead of just going, oh, um, here's that one brand ad that we, that we made and that's the only thing they're going to see over the next 8 to 12 weeks. Once someone engages with one of the ads, have it set up so that engagement triggers the next ad set and that engagement triggers the next ad set. And you can even go so far as to have certain engagements trigger different media types. So they may engage on, on Facebook and that, uh, that Facebook engagement then filters over to, you know, for example, serving a Hulu or an Amazon Prime ad. So those are some of the things that you're going to want to think about from, a, from a, a smoke versus signal standpoint. Because if you're delivering that wrong messaging, Ultimately, that's going to hinder your ability to convert uh, to convert those folks that 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 you're looking at. And I realized I just talked through that whole thing without even clicking over to this, which had what I was talking about. So I'll leave that up there for a second. <laughs> okay, I'm leaving it because you're taking pictures. And I'm going to use this chance to deal with cotton mouth. Not because of what's legal in Nevada, by the way. That that's not why. Uh, or is it? I'm not even sure. OK, so let's get into some of the targeting techniques themselves. Um, I do touch on the different platforms that all of this is available on. So utilizing email targeting, you can target individuals based upon the email platforms that they are using. So. Um, you know, because they're bigger, I'll just pick on Bank of America. You can use someone that has um, uh, I I I incoming email traffic from, say, AOL or Yahoo from Bank of America to actually target uh, those individuals. Um, you can also use the fact that they're visiting their specific website to build lookalike audiences, again, to target those individuals. Um, that kind of touches on that custom signal creation where, again, if they're going to a competitor's website, most of us really don't go around to different financial websites for fun. Uh, we're either looking for something specific or we're an active customer or an active member at, at, at that organization. So it also allows you to tailor those incentives and have some of that longer term engagement. Um, 
the purchase-based targeting uh, that, that is available, I think, is another key one to look at, especially those of you that have very, uh, very advanced uh, information from, from the core. What, not many of you have done this, and I've been suggesting it for a while, and no one ever listens to me, but that's fine. Um, what you want to do is look where money is going and where it's coming from. Okay, so let's, for example, say for ease of math, you have 100,000 accounts. Take a look at the more, you know, within that, look at the mortgage accounts. Where are those payments coming from? If those payments are coming from a competitor heavily, guess what? Someone has their likely primary checking relationship with that competitor, but they have the mortgage with you. Now you can take that customer data, take their emails, load them into a wide variety of platforms and start targeting those folks to try and break into that primary relationship and gain wallet share. The inverse is also true. Look at where the checking dollars inside of your, your accounts are going. That's going to tell you who is, you know, kind of eating your lunch a little bit. If you have someone who their only, the only real product they have is a checking product and you're wondering why, um, the, you know, you don't have them on credit cards, you don't have them on auto loans, you don't have a house or a HELOC, you know, take a look at where their money's going. You're going to see, you can, it's all in there. You can see where it's going and utilize that data. So, by using that first party data, you're gonna be able to build much greater purchase-based targeting. And because things like income targeting are becoming far more difficult, you actually have to take that, um, take that data that you have both internally and that external behavioral data and layer that together to create likely, um, uh, likely purchasers. So for example, um, take a CD offer that has a hundred thousand dollar minimum. Okay. They're out there. They exist. Um, you're probably going to not approach someone that has a $45,000 a year income with that sort of offer. Reality is not going to have cash laying around for that. So that what you want to do is you want to model that sort of purchasing behavior to ensure that that offer is getting in front of people that very likely have that kind of liquidity laying around and they're looking to move it. So does that you know, cause kind of an, an issue when you're like, well, geez, when we really look at that number, that takes our available market and plummets it. Well, your other option is to you know, reduce that heavy minimum that you have. So looking at those kind of cases and adjusting your targeting based upon that kind of uh, propensity to actually become uh, a, you know, a new account, I think is uh, incredibly important. Uh, app detection, obviously key. If they have downloaded a competitor's app, they're probably a customer. So that's a real easy one. Um, the tailoring of the financial officer, uh, offers and the utilization of the data partnerships. So here I kind of mentioned a couple of them. You can use things like True Data and Start IO are two organizations that can port data into other DSPs as well as um, Meta, for example. And that's gonna allow you to do much better targeting than is available on the actual platforms themselves. The, the targeting on Facebook within the platform is actually pretty weak. Um, I almost never suggest utilizing really any of any of that natively inside of uh, inside of meta it's really not that good moreover um boosting is is one of the worst things that you can do you might as well just take money stack it in the street and light it on fire and that fire might attract some people because it's so the, the lack of targeting is just um honestly offensive so taking other uh, uh, other data sources and porting them in is key. Now, are you going to pay more for that? Yeah, there's going to be a charge for that data coming in. Usually it's charged on a CPM model. So yes, you're going to pay more, but the name of this game isn't paying less. Actually, by doing tactics like this, your CPMs are going to go up. Um, your click costs are probably going to go up. All of that stuff will increase, but what matters is effectiveness. Uh, focusing on things like CPM, CPCs, that's just not a viable way to look at marketing performance. You, and you know, probably preaching to the choir, you really need to be looking at accounts gained, dollar spent, lifetime value of the accounts, uh, et cetera. 
Um, I touched on this one already from a keyword targeting standpoint, but this is one that I, I very much enjoy because you're actually using a massive strength against a, a, a competitor. And if you have someone that is spending large dollars on television or on um, uh, outdoor or on a major sponsorship, right? They're putting a lot of money into getting their brand out there. So that's a strength. Well, every strength is a weakness, you know. So take that strength, use their own branded keywords, go after their product branded keywords. There's nothing wrong with utilizing that within Google AdWords. You're not gonna get in trouble. Um, can you, you know, you can't put it into the ad copy. You can't use uh, trademark words in the ad copy, but you know, the Google police aren't going to show up and get mad at you. Um, the worst that's going to happen is your page rank is going to, is going to take a bit of a, uh, well, your ad rank is going to take a bit of a beating and you're going to end up paying more. But if it's effective, it really doesn't matter that you're paying more. So that is something to look for. Um, the next thing is content uh, recognition targeting. So identifying viewers of competitors' ads. Uh, so you can utilize different technologies to find individuals that are actually viewing the competition's ads and then serving your own ads because of that fact. Then also obviously tailoring that ad content and placing th those ads based upon that behavior. Most of your DSPs are gonna have some availability for this. I do have a list of the DSPs at the end that, are, that, that you can utilize. They don't have you know, massive minimums. Um, usually it might be a couple thousand dollars a month in spend. So um, really not that difficult to kind of start messing with this on your own and seeing what sort of, what sort of value you can get from it. Now, the next component is looking at uh, the competitor's branches. And this one is very important based on how you set it up because let's say there's a branch related to a headquarters. Um, well, you don't wanna be serving ads to their employees unless maybe you're, going, you're trying to poach them from an HR standpoint, which in that case, you do wanna serve ads to their employees. But you can set up that geofencing so that you're targeting the amount of visits they have there. Reality is, if you set that to three or four visits over the course of a week, it's likely anyone that's doing that many visits is an employee. Now, obviously, when we have things like hybrid, keep people coming to the office two days a week, et cetera, that does kind of throw a bit of a, you know, a wrench into the mix. But take those things into account so you can limit uh, the amount of employee waste. Now, if you're going for someone with not many employees, it, it may feel like it doesn't matter, but I'm of the opinion that trying to get into the habit of limiting who you're going after as opposed to expanding is actually the key to performance. I feel that, and you know, from the standpoint of actually executing on this, we put far more effort into who we're not targeting than who we are. It's the not that actually wins. Um, the, the, uh, the exclusionary targeting is far, far more powerful and you're going to be able to get a much better return than saying, who's everyone that we can hit? How, how far can this reach go? Um, so that kind of moves on to how some of these platforms actually construct, you know, how you actually construct the targeting in some of these platforms. So this is a direct screenshot out of Stack Adapt. Stack Adapt is one of the better ones. I don't have any stake in other than, you know, we use them too. Um, and it's an incredibly powerful platform. There's a lot that you can do in it, but the thing that you, no, no one here can probably read because it's too small, but this is the key thing that you're looking at. Um, uh, 483,000. That's how many different targeting package options existed just from one search. So you can see how many different ways you can go about doing targeting, and this isn't about selecting one. Um, I've seen targeting packages going up to, to 150, 200 different types of targeting just for a singular campaign. The reason why we go that far is because from that limiting factor that we're trying to do, and because so much of the targeting buckets that exist, um, they're pretty leaky buckets. 
and there's a lot that you know you really aren't getting by having that specific targeting in place so by taking these and saying all right here's who we want and then really pummeling that with who you don't want, you're going to be able to get rid of a lot of that media wastage that is honestly just killing the budgets that, 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 that you're running. So this is one where, you know, you're going to want to have someone on staff that has a little bit of experience with a DSP. That's something to look for, um, which stands for uh, demand side platform, by the way. And if, if, if you don't have that, Take the time to learn. Stack Adapt has a great training program. They'll put you through all the training. They'll teach you how to use this system. Um, there really isn't a cost for, for going through that, that, that self-service. They also have some managed service uh, uh, aspects that you can utilize. So I really suggest digging into a couple of these, these different platforms and seeing which one from a cost standpoint and from a usability standpoint um, makes sense for you. So the, 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 the fact that cookies are going away, they're slowly scaling them down. I think end of this year, it's supposed to be all gone is going to have an impact on this. All right. This will become harder. Geo-targeting will become harder. Everything's going to become more difficult. So that's why I can't tell you what you should do about that. Um, because no one really knows. No one knows how it's ultimately all going to flesh out or if they're going to get really close to this and then like two years ago throw something out and say, oh, no, we're going back to this again. So none of us have any control over this particular point. But by getting into these different DSPs now, I think understanding how this all functions now so you can have a data point that says, well, this is how it was working when we had that, you know, more, more of a cookie-based targeting, and this is how it was working after that change. I think you're going to have a better handle on if, you're, if you should be happy with your performance, because I think all of us are going to see performance knockdowns until we can actually figure out through a lot of testing what to do about, uh, you know, about that particular challenge. So, the last couple slides touching on the key takeaways. Um, one, and most importantly, is that competitive analysis. Being honest with yourself, and I know even more challenging is being you know, very honest and direct with executive teams and boards about where the strengths and weaknesses lie. Um, you have to get everyone else on board with this sort of thinking, because if you don't, you're gonna get questions like, oh, oh how come we're not doing this or how come? Well, we can't go after them because they simply are too strong of a competitor for us to actively uh, take that, that business from them. So having that competitive analysis in place, having buy-in from everyone, having a matrix that everyone agrees to, and ultimately I feel having, a tar ha having an overall competitive targeting list that goes all the way up the chain, maybe even to the CEO if they're that involved, I think is a, is a great idea. Um, selecting your strategic offers, knowing who, what you're going to offer and to whom is very important. So make sure that you are aligning the weaknesses and the strengths with that messaging that you're creating. And I'm sure there's been a couple of conversations about using things like chat GPT and generative design. Uh, makes it a lot easier uh, to do some of those things. And then your platform and partner selection. This one's pretty important because on here I list some of the folks that you can look at. Stack Adapt, Chusel, Brandzuka, Mountain is a newer one, does a lot of video. Uh, the Trade Desk, usually that one has some pretty high minimums. So that one's a little tougher to get onto. Uh, and Media Math, these are all just a few options that you can look at. But again, if you go on and Google DSP or demand side uh, platforms, you're going to find a lot of capability. Moreover, if you're already working with uh, you know, an outside media partner, they should be able to do everything I just said. There's nothing on here that they should not be able to do. So um, ask the questions. Bring, you know, say, hey, if I gave you a list of uh, our uh, specific competitors and all of their branches, would you be able to help us build a campaign to do X, Y, or Z? So um, all that is going to be completely possible. So. Uh, there's eight minutes left. 
and I can answer questions. So if there are questions, I will answer them.